time with us in the Senate. Oh, sure. Happy to. Um, we had asked, I hope you got the latest version of Shore 22, and we had asked for comments on the bill. I have uh, version 3.1. Is that the latest? That's the latest. Yep. Good. Good. Um, and what, you know, you have it. Uh, and we really appreciate the Mont Law School. Um, by the way, Senator Benning is here, and I believe he's a graduate of the Vermont Law School class of, he will tell you what class he was in because um, it was a while ago. 1983, but who's counting? <laughs> ah, wonderful. Uh, you must have been in school with Maureen Martin. That I was, and she's planning to have an alumni meeting dinner at her house uh, this coming to June. Oh, wonderful. So, Brian, we'd be happy to hear any comments you have on the, particularly on the constitutionality of the bill as it stands now. Sure. Um, I guess the, the short answer is that I agree with uh, Mr. Scherr from the Attorney General's office. Uh, I think the, the bill is constitutional because it's balanced um, and it's measured. Uh, it's balanced because it reflects the special needs doctrine um, and, and the special needs doctrine's purpose, which is to uh, balance public safety and, and, uh, and individual rights. And I also think that it's, it's uh, measured because while there is a, a potential uh, deprivation of one's firearms, that in my mind, uh, that deprivation is, is minimal because of the very short uh, amount of time between the potential seizure of the weapon uh, and the opportunity to go before a judge and, uh, and have due process, which uh, the next business day, which I think is about as uh, as minimal a uh, potential deprivation as you could have. I think it's also, uh, feel free to interrupt me if you have questions. Um, it, it's also uh, important to point out that uh, uh, the bill uh, fits very well with the uh, the, the well-established uh, special needs doctrine. The, the whole point under that doctrine is that uh, uh, the Vermont Supreme Court has held that once a court decides that, uh, that, or in this case, a legislature decides that there's a special need, such as public safety, um, then the objective is to balance that need against the privacy intrusion at stake. At stake. And I think while there there is a privacy intrusion here. I think it's very well balanced against the uh, against the, the special need. Um, and I would just point out that uh, this doctrine, as I said, is well established. The, the Vermont Supreme Court, under it, has uh, upheld a number of uh, circumstances of of uh, warrantless searches. Uh, it's upheld random searches of, of prison cells for contraband. Uh, probably the most analogous situation is that upheld the warrantless seizure of a gun from an automobile that was about to be impounded in order to protect public safety, um, and a number of other circumstances. There are four or five uh, circumstances under which the court has used the uh, special needs doctrine to allow for a seizure of a weapon, even though the weapon was not necessarily evidence. Uh, in a criminal prosecution. So I think uh, what, what, uh, uh, what you have here is, is a bill that fits well under that, uh, under that special needs doctrine and, and therefore I, uh, I support it. I, I only have one question about it and uh, I can uh, address that now or I can I no, can no, please that. No, please do, please do. Okay. Uh, my one question, uh, and, and, and again, it is a question I don't have the answer. I, I would, uh, I guess, recommend that uh, if, if you folks don't know the answer, that you talk to Mr. Scherr about it. Uh, it's on page 2, line 19, mm -hmm. and it talks about uh, the circumstances under which the officer may remove the firearm, of course, if it's, if it's contraband. Yep if it's in the immediate possession or control of the person being arrested, and then, or discovered. I think. And I'm, I'm not sure what the word discovered means here. Uh, in particular, I guess what I'm wondering is if the ex-spouse or the spouse or the girlfriend tells the officer he's threatened to kill me, 
he has guns in the basement or he has guns in the shed or he has guns in the barn, would this bill allow the officer to then go and look for the guns um, without, uh, without a warrant? In other words, would discovered cover that? And I, I just don't know, and I'm, I'm wondering if, if that was the Attorney General's language. That's a good question. I'm not sure, and we didn't okay. ask. So thank you okay. for sure. pointing that out. Yeah. Um, we struck the, during a consensual search, it's yeah. dis so it would read, or discovered under exigent circumstances. Oh, um, I no, wonder if that's what no, he meant. No, it doesn't say that. It says where? On line 19. Uh, I guess I have the... Or discovered. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. You're absolutely no, I right. I, I, did, I did miss that. I, it was it's a little so, hard for somebody who doesn't deal with legislative things often to know what the well, difference is between the light strikeout and the dark... The yep. dark one, but you're absolutely yep. right. Discovered under okay, that's that's fine, and that would uh, that would satisfy my concern. Right. Because exigent circumstances are well established okay. in the law. Okay, so that's not an issue any longer. Well, I, I don't think so. Um, the, Discovered under exigent circumstances typically means discovered uh, under under circumstances where it's impractical to to get a warrant, um, where uh, there's where time is of the essence. There's an immediate threat. Um, I guess I'm still not sure though um, how far the reach of the search uh, could go. Uh, again, if you have a situation where uh, she says he's, he's threatened to kill me. Um, and I could understand, obviously, you take the, any firearms that are under the person's immediate control, um, anything that's in plain view of the officer. Um, discovered under exigent, exigent circumstances, I, I'm, I guess I'm still not sure whether that would extend to um, you know, the, the barn or the basement. Um, and probably it would be best to uh, ask the Attorney General what, yep. what he envisions there. We will. OK. Thank you for pointing that sure, out. Sure, sure. And, and thank you for pointing out that I, I missed a couple of words. I just read right over them, but I, I still have the question. Okay, I think it's a good question. Are there any other comments on this? Uh, comments from me? Oh, no. Bill, yeah. Do uh, you think striking consensual search is a positive thing, or does that help it? Or? Let's see. Um, That's uh, still on line 19. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do, you, do you recall what the thinking was behind doing that? Well, there was concern that, um, on my part, I struck it. There was concern, I, in this draft, I asked Eric Fitzpatrick, Legislative Council, to strike it. Yeah. And I did because there was concern about, um, you know, clearly if your scenario where he's threatened to kill her um, and um, the police officer would, I would think, would be able to get a warrant because hopefully they've arrested the person, removed them from the scene, and during that time would be able to get a warrant in between time, um, you know, developing probable cause. They've, they've seen probable cause, they've arrested the person, they've removed them, Hopefully they could get a warrant for any other firearms. <clears throat> so, but the concern was if, let's say, let's use he, she again. There is probable cause to believe the crime has been, of domestic assault has been committed. Could she then say, well, he's got guns in the basement. And it's a, you know, it's not, it's his house, not her house. Um, or it's their combined house. What does yeah, that and mean? then you run into the question: um, if, if if they live there together, she would uh, presumably have authority to agree to the search. Right. Uh, if if they don't live there together, then that becomes uh, much more problematic. Right. Yeah. So. And the other the other thing is you. Um, I don't. I, I think it's it's probably. Um, a bit of an oxymoron to talk about consensual search under exigent circumstances because 
typically exigent circumstances are an exception to the warrant requirement. So you probably wouldn't need the consent if the, if the circumstances really were exigent. That's supposed to be separate. I think it should be an order. Yeah, it's oh, also just drafting confusion because okay. consensual search is struck out in this version. Okay. So I see his point. Okay, well, as well, you testify, and as Eric points out, there should have been an or there, and we may have missed it in drafting. Okay. So it would be or it discovered under ex exigent circumstances or a consensual search. Oh, okay, okay. And we would strike out my version. Again, me, Dick Sears only, would strike yeah. out consensual search. Okay. And wasn't some of the problem there that the if the person if they're not actually physically together on the site, they can't. Well, the question came up in testimony. <coughs> um, I think Senator Benning said something to the effect, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I think he said, so if they have separate bedrooms, <coughs> let's say they're not, they're not even in a romantic relationship. They just happen to be roommates, and they have separate their housemates and they have separate bedrooms, does that give him, the police officer the right to search his bedroom? And yeah, and, and um, can she consent to searching his, his bed, or can he right. say it's two, he, two college roommates who have separate rooms? Yeah, yeah, and that's, um, that also, uh, requires a determination by a court of um, just how much authority the um, uh, the person who's consenting has over the other person's bedroom. I mean, if, if, if for example, the, the easy case would be if the, uh, the person who has the, the weapon or who, who is uh, the alleged assailant uh, keeps the bedroom locked and, you know, doesn't and, and holds on to the key, uh, then I think you have that person would have a pretty good argument that uh, uh, that the roommate did not have authority uh, to consent to the search. So um, the whole consent issue becomes a, a difficult one that, that then the court has to has to figure out. Right, I agree. So uh, other comments and other questions for Professor Corbin? Hey, thank you so much. We appreciate your testimony, Brian. Oh, you're quite welcome. Thank Very you. Helpful. Thank, and, you. And, thank uh, you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye now. Bye bye. <coughs> All right. Well, that was helpful. And so this is appropriate that David Sure would be next. All right. Can you say what your language was? You were talking about something being struck here and the word or being put in. Well, I think David will, it should have read. As I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, it should read, if you didn't strike during consensual search, Sorry, you see, don't worry, it should see. read, or discover Stand. under exigent circumstances, if you were to add in or during a consensual search, I think. Well, that's the way it is now. It's just that because during a consensual search is being struck, there's no need to have it all. Right. We, so he was conflating the two and thinking that if you took the strike out away, it would mean discovered during a consensual search under a consensual search, but that wouldn't be the case. Well, I don't know. Well, that's what the Well, I think we'll, we'll listen to the witnesses, but right now, we're not. It's a policy decision of this committee. Um, and All right, uh, if the committee's ready, David Chair with the Attorney General's Office, accompanied by Carolyn Hansen, also the Attorney General's Office, who's had a lot of on-the-ground practical experience with some of these issues and can provide a couple of illustrations. To start with, overall, we think most of the changes in this in 3.1 are, are good. Um, very few issues. Uh, but as we've touched on, uh, the Attorney General's Office does prefer the language of including a consensual search um, and we would prefer to not have the qualifier imminent harm on line one of uh, page three. On the consensual search issue, and, and to bring up one suggestion that um, Judge Grierson actually suggested and we think is a, a good idea that would cover um, a number of 
legal circumstances. Uh, one option we could have there during, in that space on lines 19 and 20 is just to say, or discover during a lawful search, um, which summarizes things without having to go into the weeds. But that's a decision the committee can make. I think it's important to keep in mind when we're thinking about the consensual search issue that this bill will not change when a consensual search can happen. If it can happen now, um, it can happen after this bill is passed. If it can't happen now, it cannot happen after this bill is passed. What this does do is change the, the purpose for which a consensual search can happen and changes what an what officer can get. Let's say there's a senator who has a renting a house during the legislative session with two other legislators. And there is a woman who comes in with one of those senators. I don't know what the relationship might be. And that woman claims domestic violence. And the police come, and that senator is charged, they find probable cause and is charged. My question would be, if we leave consensual search in or, or don't, would they have a right to search the other two senators or legislators, excuse me, not senators, legis I'm thinking of the McAllister case quite frankly. Um, would they have a right to search the other two senators um, or representative and senators' uh, rooms in that building since they weren't involved? And the question is, how much uh, was were those other rooms common space? And I think right. the answer, if they're separate bedrooms, that the senator in question, who's being questioned, um, didn't have access to as a matter of course, it probably would not be something that the police could lawfully access under that search because the woman could not <laughs> consent to it. I mean, the other factor here is if the woman didn't really live there, if it was something that she had just shown up that evening, she would have very little ability to consent to any search of the home because there's really no um, possessory interest there. Uh, if this individual had been living in that room, then they could consent to a search of that room, but I don't see how they could consent to a search of rooms where they didn't commonly have access to. So, you know, it sounds like um to get the consensual search, you, you've got to do an interrogation of people there and find out what their relationships are, what they, you know, what are their areas where they want <coughs> to go. I mean, it doesn't seem reasonable, does it? Well, it's exactly what happens now. Again, we're not changing. It's exactly what police, it's the inquiry police have to make right now, because we're not changing. Well, is this fluff? No, <laughs> no, Senator, it's not, it's not fluff. The idea is we're not changing when consensual searches can happen. So those questions that police have to do right now, I mean, if they're searching for evidence of a crime and they get consent from one of several roommates, they're going to have to make some, they're going to have to figure some stuff out about what that consent means. And that happens right now. There's, this bill does not change that type of inquiry. The only, what this does change is what can you take pursuant to a lawful search. Uh, and that, in now this bill allows for firearms that are not evidence of a crime but may pose a danger to be seized if for safety purposes. View. Well, it depends on how you carve out. And um, under exigent circumstances. So what's the difference between consensual search and exigent circumstances? I would view exigent circumstances as fewer circumstances in which you could actually search something. So exigent circumstances are when an officer needs to say a suspect is seems to pose a danger is running through a house, the officer would, I think, would have a right to chase that person because they need to. They don't know what's going to happen. They don't know who's <coughs> safe or unsafe. Uh, and so that's an exigent circumstance where they're running after this guy or girl. And, um, and then what, sort of what they see along the way, that would be lawfully viewed and uh, would be a carve out to the warrant requirement. <coughs> is it an exigent circumstance if the officer believes whoever the complaining witness is that they are under threat of death, uh, that the individual who's labeled the perpetrator is threatening imminent harm, and the officer decides that uh, that rises to the level of exigent circumstances? 
I, I think one other distinction to keep in mind here is that with cases like that, we're getting towards territory where that is probably a crime. If there's been a threat, a death threat, and um, and there's a weapon involved in that death threat, then we have a crime, and now we're back into the sort of normal territory that we've always had uh, in terms of when to get a warrant and when the circumstances are exigent, and this bill really wouldn't come into play at all. And can I just add, I think it's important to keep in mind. Can you identify yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Carolyn Hansen with the Attorney General's Office, as David mentioned. I think it's important to keep in mind that the concept that you're bringing up, exigent circumstances, is not something that's new to police. They get tons of training in what that means at the academy. And in your example, Senator Sears, the, the idea that there's going to be a, a consensual search in that situation, I didn't hear any facts that suggested that would even come up. So I think it's, it's important to know that just because there's a complaint of domestic violence doesn't mean that you automatically jump to 422 and you automatically start acting for a consensual search. I didn't hear anything in that example that suggested to me we would even get to this. And I think the key concept, or the key conceptual separation is just that we're not changing the law around what's a lawful search or what's not a lawful search here. What, what is presently lawful will remain lawful, and what isn't lawful will remain unlawful. Um, so so that, this bill is not altering that. What it is doing is just allowing, pursuant to a lawful search, it, it is now allowing people to officers to get weapon, firearms that may be a danger to the household member. And that's the difference that we're talking about here. That's the change the law is making. So I understand the committee's concern around making sure we understand what the law is no. on search, but we're not changing the law on search. All right. Any other questions for David? Or no? Hang in there. And can I, can I say one thing? I just wanted to give you an example, since you brought up the idea of is this, is this just fluff? Yeah. Um, I wanted to give you an example. Um, Molly McLean, who was murdered last summer um, by her husband, Jason McLean, she wrote, Jason keeps a rifle on the floor in a corner in the open so he can look at it and mention where it is. So I have to be aware that it is right there where he can always access it. I feel he might get angry and use it against me if he's angry enough. That's an example of the kind of situation where an officer might shift gears and decide, OK, I'm here because Molly's been punched in the face, and I'm going to make an arrest based on that. But when an officer hears that there's a firearm that's sitting somewhere in the house and that that's the interpretation, that's not evidence of a crime. The situation you mentioned earlier where the officer might have then been able to make the physical arrest, which he's going to do, and then go back and apply for a search warrant, there's not going to be a search warrant issued to go get that firearm. Well, that goes back to the, the, the whole thing where I had the problem, and I still have a problem with this bill, <clears throat> is when you cite somebody to come to court a couple of weeks from now, what gives you the, what, why wouldn't you arrest? But even if we assume in that situation that there was an arrest, right, that the right. person was taken in, there's still, without this bill, there's no lawful basis to get that gun because the gun isn't evidence of a crime. And what this bill does is it allows I for... Answer my question about citing. I, I couldn't answer as to why you wouldn't arrest well, I mean, that's the, I'm going back to the House version as passed by, by the House. And one of the reasons that I thought it was that I presumed that it was unconstitutional was the idea of having a law enforcement officer search when somebody was merely cited into court, which could be a month from now or two weeks from the time of the alleged assault. And that's where I had the problem with the House bill. It wasn't necessarily with the idea or the concept. It was that I, and I was getting so much pressure from groups who thought that I was just you know, didn't care about victims. I do care about victims, but it, 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 the House version of the bill was so bad in my, my, I didn't know that I could fix it. So I was reluctant to take it up, not thinking I could fix it. And I, I think we've come close to a fix here, but I'm still stuck on the idea, of the citing, when you don't arrest, when under the Rule three, they can arrest when there's domestic, probable cause to believe domestic assault occurred. 
I'm, I want to make sure I understand your question, though, because that is the preferred response in any domestic violence case where a police officer has authority why under Rule is, 3. Why is the site in there? Well, uh, maybe just to cover every possible circumstance how somebody could land in court on a domestic assault charge, because it could be, as you described earlier, a roommate situation. No intimate partner violence, for instance, and maybe the officer felt that citation in that case was the way to go. Um, I, I can't speak to why. I can tell you that, for instance, I spoke with Tracy Shriver this week because one of the things I'd seen in one of the reports that you all said was that Wyndham County had a high incidence of issuing citations. And Tracy said, in her experience, that was not the case. It was 85 to 95 percent of folks that would be lodged in that circumstance, at least in the past. Now, things have changed a little bit lately. But they had the authority to make an arrest, so a physical arrest if there's an exception to Rule 3, and that is the preferred response. But I think the reason why I brought that example up to you is that's a scenario where, for instance, the officer might then think that he, he, if he shifted gears and said, you know, I'm really concerned. I've heard from officers, sometimes they say they leave a house, and they say to themselves, I think he's going to kill her one day. And in that scenario, that officer might, if he has the time and the ability, he might say, would you agree to a consensual search for me to see if there's any firearms, the firearm you're mentioning. And then the officer, if he got assigned consensual search, and again, going back to your point, officers receive a lot of training in what a consensual search means, he would then go and conduct that search to find a firearm at a given time. And, and that would happen in that, in, in a, potentially in a case like this where it wouldn't happen otherwise. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, I just, when you, when you were giving your example at the beginning, you said, um, so the, this is a situation, I, I, this is what I heard, I'm not sure this is what you said. This is a situation where they would not the next day have been awarded, or whatever one does, a search for that weapon. Why, why would that not have been, why was there not enough evidence there that it was connected to something or in order to get a search warrant you have to be searching for evidence of a crime okay. so the officers would have to have probable cause that it's that a specific crime had been committed and then you have to be able to say that this is evidence of that crime and you also have to be able to say with some specificity where that item will be found so the judge could issue so, a warrant if, if, if for instance if some, all those but yes. you couldn't go back the, the, the guy is arrested he's taken down to jail, and now you can't just get an, a search warrant to go search for all those guns that might be in the house because they're not connected. So that I, I, I didn't go there. I that is very helpful. I'm, Thank I'm you. I'm still puzzled yeah. about the Thank site. You. I, I, you know, maybe Judge Grierson can help me with it, but I'm, I'm just puzzled by why Joe even has capital, but I'm still puzzled by citing. By citing, yeah. About citing and not actually removing the individual from the scene when you can. So if you think it's serious and you think that danger might happen, why would you cite for two weeks from now or a month from now? Why would a police officer do that if they didn't feel it was serious? I suspect they do that because they don't feel they have probable cause and they want to develop a case with the state's attorney or whatever. So I'm just suspicioning that this, so I have a friend who used to say suspicioning. I'm just speculating that that might be the case. And when I, when I do that, it just brings the whole thing, brings me back to an extreme risk provision that could be through the family court if 221 passes. Yeah, and I think that that's a really important bill, too, but I think this does something that that doesn't do. I agree, but I'm still puzzled. I think, oh, sorry. I decided, but Joe, go ahead. I'm going to be puzzled. I'll probably vote for the end of I'm probably still be puzzled by this until, you know, somebody proves me out wrong. Well, so, if, if you wanted other examples, there are other examples if you want. I'm sorry? S-221 would take care of the situation without any problem 
as I understand. I also don't understand why if a potential victim is standing there screaming, saying, I've just been assaulted, I'm afraid he's gonna kill me, he said he wants to kill me, why that doesn't give the officer almost carte blanche opportunity to take any weapon at the scene, the way this language is there, whether there's a consent to search or not. Isn't that an exigent circumstance? Well, again, Senator, I think that the, when you're talking about a hypothetical like that, you are talking about in a situation where you've got evidence of a crime. And, and so you're sort of out of the 422 territory and back into regular, um, regular criminal procedure. I, what, what you're asking, essentially, and what we've been struggling with, is you're presuming the existence of weapons in a house in any domestic situation whatsoever should be presumed to be a further potential problem and the weapon should be removed. That's essentially what you're saying this bill does as opposed to anything else we've talked about. And it's not just us presuming that. There's significant I, I, data. I've, I've heard the data and the statistics. I'm somewhat troubled by the, the desire to suddenly say we like this and we're giving up the waiting period that we thought was there for the cooling off time. But essentially what you're saying is no matter what the officer chooses to do here or not, we know he could arrest the individual, which would take care of the immediate problem. But you're still saying that whether the person's arrested or not, any guns in the home must be presumed to be a further problem and therefore should be removed as long as a consensual search is given. And I don't know how else to explain it, but it seems to me that in the case, I don't remember when Molly was killed in relation to the date where he was originally cited. But if my memory is correct, there was a period of time that transpired between point A and point B. That would clearly be covered by S-221 without question. This, I, I guess I keep coming back to the <coughs> circumstances. It's giving you exactly what you're asking for. We don't get messed up in whether it's a consensual search or not. Why would the officer have to ask for a consensual search if, in fact, it's exigent circumstances, yet get the guns removed? Am I missing something? I think the, the gap where this bill does a lot of work is the situation where you don't have uh, an exigent circumstance or evidence of a crime where, so, where a victim is saying, but I there's a gun here that I have. That's where I see 221 working perfectly correctly. The officer walks away and says, you know, the more I think about it, he's going to kill her someday. That's the ammunition you need to start building with 221. And it's also important to remember that with 221, it, it's definitely doing important work and may serve that situation. But it may, there may not be an order that issues. There may not be an order that meets the, the they may not uh, be able to compile the evidence sufficient to say that this is uh, a risk of imminent harm. I'm forgetting the exact language of the standard in 221. Um, it's not a guarantee that you'll get that order, and it's not a guarantee that you'll be able to get the firearms. This does provide that guarantee. That's where we remove the judicial oversight. I think that's where it frees us, at least, to have the trouble with this bill. Well, the judicial oversight will come very, very rapidly. And one final point, I think we've um, made our point extensively about the consensual search and do feel that it's very important to make sure the bill can do the work it needs to do. Just briefly, we'll mention the imminent harm phrase on page, line one of page three. Um, some concern that that makes it more difficult for officers to make a judgment as to when these things are necessary. As we heard the Montpelier police chief testify last week, they do like clarity and uh, and clear direction in terms of what they should do. Uh, this bill already does leave them with a lot of discretion. And the imminent harm standard is, I think it's going to be hard for uh, an officer uh, trying to make decisions to decide what exactly that means. So I just think it's clear to leave that out, uh, give the officer the discretion to make a decision on a case-by-case -case basis, and then allow the judge to review it very shortly after that. And I'll leave that there unless there's any questions. Okay. Any Thank you. Questions? <coughs> Thank you.
song from the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. Um, so I just wanted to start off this morning um, going back to a concern that I heard from the committee before, and I followed up on it um, just to do my own homework on, um, I, I uh, talked to some Vermont attorneys about um, the concern that um, if there had been, uh, for example, a mother hitting a child um, that that we would be um, removing firearms in those circumstances. So I, I checked into this. Um, first, I just want to say that the network holds the position that dangerous people should not have access to dangerous weapons. Um, and I just want to clarify for the record that in Vermont, um, now that I've consulted with some attorneys on this, I've been informed that a mother hitting a child would would more likely result in a cruelty to a child charge than a domestic assault. But I would defer to state's attorneys on, on how that all would play out. But if that were the case, then um, H-422 would not necessarily come into play. So I just wanted to clarify that one issue. Excuse me just a second. Do you have that testimony so I can make my notes? Oh, yeah, actually, I'm sorry. I forgot. Yes, I do have. Yeah, you can make notes on it. I just want to stop right there. Miranda Shapley just got done serving 10 days in jail. She was charged with both cruelty to a child and domestic assault. She got found not guilty on the cruelty to a child and convicted on the domestic assault. So I don't know who gave you the information, but your information is not correct. And I don't want to make an issue of it, but I can't just let it go. No, that's fine. And and I, I understood like it would be fact, it would be based on the facts of the case too. So yeah, of course, of course. Um, and um, again, you know, it, it, for us, it goes back to uh, the assessment of the danger in the situation and whether a dangerous person really should have access to dangerous weapons. And um, so, yeah, so we stand, stand there. Um, okay. Well, why don't you go back so, to your testimony? Yeah, okay. So um, I have a little bit more in my testimony about why it's important and why it's needed, but we've talked about the... Um, research backing up the lethality of a combination between firearms and domestic violence, and that's really what this is rooted in. Um, it's needed because we understand that combination and we want law enforcement officers to have the tools they need to lawfully remove firearms that, are, that they currently cannot. Um, so that, is, that goes to what the AG's prior testimony just was. So to that end, we want to keep consensual search um, in the language. Um, <clears throat> it's important to remember when we're thinking about this that um, H-422 is really a discretionary uh, bill. It, it allows law enforcement the discretion to make some decisions at the scene. It's not requiring them to make those decisions. New Hampshire state law requires uh, the removal at the scene um, and others, uh, 12 other states that are similar have that requirement as well. And we, um, we uh, started off with shell and we ended up with with may in our language for that that reason to give law enforcement that, that discretion so currently under consensual search the way um, we're understanding it from the ag's office is that 
Um, it can currently be done. Law enforcement officers are familiar with how to do that. Um, and um, what 422 would do would be to allow that search to happen for um, firearms that are not evidence of that crime, um, but um, still um, pose a danger. So um, we would support keeping consensual search in there. I also um, put in my testimony, I, we'd heard in the past that victims um, often will say, like the, the worry about uh, the victims who own the firearm and um, whether that firearm will be taken um, if the victim wants to keep the firearm uh, to protect herself. And I just wanted to cite that we have some data that, that shows that um, when the victim is a woman and the woman owns the firearm, that um, regardless of ownership, that firearm in the household makes it more likely that that woman will die um, from a homicide in a domestic violence household. And uh, so this was a California study from 91 to 96 that concluded that women who owned a gun died by firearm homicide at twice the rates of women who did not. Um, and I cited that study at the end of my testimony. So I just wanted to also revisit that issue. I also want to say that um, we'd like to delete the imminent harm. And as soon as I read that, I, I remembered a case that I was familiar with in my work where um, a victim was aware of it, it sort of impending um, abuse when her abuser would um, turn uh, his wedding band. Um, he just would look at her and turn his wedding band. And she would know that that meant I need to stop talking, he's going he's gonna to beat me later if I don't. So those kinds of imminent harm, you know, they're hard to detect in a situation. A law enforcement officer may not be perceiving imminent harm, and the victim may be perceiving imminent harm. So that judgment of what is imminent harm and when it is perceived is a little bit, um, in, the, in these cases, possibly uh, more tricky. Um, also, if the purpose of the imminent harm, which I'm thinking it may be, putting that in there, was to ensure that the firearms not be removed in the event that a citation is given, like for an older now incident. Put in there to make sure that the law enforcement officer can have a discussion about the mental health of the individual who is being accused. Mm. And it was put in there for the same reason it's in 221. It's not put in there to create more problems for victims, and I'm mm. tired of hearing that. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, it was put in there to, pro to provide the officer more information Let's say you've got somebody who's not playing with a full deck right now, mm -hmm. and the officer wants to talk to the United Counseling Service in Bennington. Right now, they can't. But if it's imminent harm, it, it takes the HIPAA. It gives you a way through HIPAA. Now, if you can find a different way to get imminent harm in there, mm -hmm. if you're concerned that imminent harm further diminishes the ability, I wasn't trying to diminish the ability, I'm trying to increase the, the information the that the yeah. officer mm -hmm. can gather. I understand, yeah, yeah. So and, and then that's important. a failure to communicate here on this one. Mm -hmm. The, the mm -hmm. term itself, imminent, comes from HIPAA regulations. Right, right, right. That's I why. understand that. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's mm -hmm. why it's in there. So okay. if, you wanted, if you wanted to further clarify, mm -hmm. I don't want people to be mm -hmm. more Your example, and I, I mean, I don't have a problem with, I want him in harm in there to, to protect the victim, not to so, harm the mm -hmm. I hear you saying, so like the goal is to bring in the mental health um, if assessment. If the person's been under mm -hmm. mental health care mm -hmm. um, or some other right. form of, of mm -hmm. that maybe the person has a brain tumor, I don't know what's mm -hmm. causing this, mm -hmm. but the officer then would be able to find out Mm -hmm. more information, and that's like information mm -hmm. power, mm -hmm. particularly in these cases. So that's the goal of this. And well, I appreciate causing, I appreciate that goal, Senator, yeah. It's causing, mm -hmm. um, if you think that imminent harm is, 
how do I put it? If you feel like it's if a little narrow. arm is narrowing mm -hmm. the focus of the officer, that it's not the intent. So you right. need to find a way to, okay. to make sure that that doesn't narrow the ability of the officer to. Right, right. That's what that's what we that's weapons. that would be our testimony. Yeah. It's just to find a way so to, there needs so to so we can find a way to both do this. Reword this so that it's mm -hmm. clear that it could be imminent harm or <coughs> something else. Add or I don't know what. Okay, so you can think on some language. Right. On that. Harm was only I understand your purpose. To mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, and then my last comment is on or any other person. And when I was thinking about this, um, we wanted to try to keep um, that language of um, protecting the officer or any other person. Because we, we know, um, you know nationally from the connection, we know the connection between uh, mass shootings and domestic violence. Um, we know that um, between 2009 and 2016, perpetrators of domestic violence accounted for 54% of mass shootings. And then generally, um, the mass shootings that are, are, are related to domestic violence, they fit a pattern of easy access to firearms. Um, of individuals who have these controlling relationships with their intimate partners, and then their control is challenged in some way. So that's like, for example, when law enforcement intervenes. Um, some people, some perpetrators feel most challenged when the law enforcement officer is intervened, they're threatened, um, their, their control has been broken, and shooting begins. And abusers often take their rage into the public arena. Um, and to seek out a victim or somebody else in the victim's life who might have challenged their power. And I know you've recognized that by keeping the family member in there, which is important because we, we do have a um, history of perpetrators targeting, for example, victims' mothers or you know, victim support people uh, that are in the family. But there are others who do not live in the household or are not family members that are in danger. And we have that, um, we've seen that historically in Vermont too. Um, for, and I'm just citing some examples here, the neighbor who called the police, the supportive family member, which I just mentioned, or the coworker or the bystander. And then I just, in the bulleted list, I've just given some examples of um, some domestic violence homicides and suicides um, that have taken place and where they have taken place because I think it's important to recognize that when they take place at work <coughs> or in an office or in a parking lot, it can put the public, it can put bystanders in danger. And I also want to just um, pull into this, the shooter themselves are oftentimes um, threatening to kill themselves uh, as a way of coercively controlling mm -hmm. their victim, but then also some carry, carry that out. And we've had murder-suicides in Vermont, and Maidstone, um, the Molly McLean case was, was one of them, in fact. Um, but we've had a number of them, um, and any other person would cover the shooter as well. Um, and I think that's something that was sort of missed in the language that was crafted um, this time around. So. Uh, Eric, uh, the person being arrested or cited meant to cover okay. the shooter. OK, OK, great. So, um, so yeah, so I just point I'm out these. Wrong. Thursday, I have to leave at quarter of 12, <laughs> not today. <laughs> So just point out these other spaces where these things might happen and put other people in danger. All right. And that's it for so my testimony. Let me, so the network would support the bill. And we need your help. Well, first of all, if consensual, if consensual search was back in. Yes. Mm -hmm. Number two was some rewording of imminent harm to right. make sure it doesn't limit the ability of the officer to mm -hmm. um, do whatever the officer needs to do. And then finally, the issue that you have a problem with is the any other person. Right. And any other person is so broad mm -hmm. um, to mean, I mean, it could be anybody. So, yeah. Um, I mean, and, and it is that concern, that connection to public safety, that domestic violence. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So broad. Uh, that's why the committee mm -hmm. decided to do that. I don't know where, where we're at on that, but I appreciate. It. So it's basically three issues. That's it. Mm -hmm. And one of them could be resolved 
with some well, language, yeah. The imminent harm can be resolved with some more language that does both. We weren't, I didn't want to narrow with imminent harm. I wanted to provide that ability. Okay. Maybe somebody has some suggestions on how we can reword that. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other questions, Robert? Thank you. Uh, Judge Grissom. I suspect six to five. David yeah. Mecklenburg knows. Why don't you take us? What did they do to it? They added a provision on uh, bump stocks. They added a provision on, I think, high uh, uh, magazines, uh, high capacity magazines. Um, How did they identify them? Ten or ten? ten. Yeah. Um, they they left in twenty-one and under, but qualified. Exceptions for, or, or no, I'm sorry, that was on the universal background checks. They have left in the 21 and under, and they put some exceptions into universal background checks for personal transfers to relatives. I believe that's, I have the bill for that. That was already in the. They had yeah. step grandfathers, oh. grandkids, step grandparents, <coughs> and stuff like that. So. How about de facto parents? <laughs> I, don't know, we, I don't know if we got into uh, that. That's right. I appreciate that, David. <coughs> Back to Judge Grissom, but thank you for you, that absolutely. clarification. You could, um, you could attach We look forward to seeing. We could the attach the whole new We look heritage. forward to seeing what the House they does do on the House. <coughs> uh, but them voting that out means they're going to deal with 221 shortly. So you could attach the 58 page parentage right. bill onto that. And right. Yes, to make sure it's genetic parents. and genetic donors. So, good morning. Genetic children. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak to uh, H422, the draft uh, 3.1, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge. I came here today uh, in part to uh, clarify, uh, hopefully, for the committee, the, the court's position on this bill. And I would start by saying we did not object to the bill. Um, I know when I was here last week um, in, in talking about this bill and listening to uh, David Shear's testimony this morning, it's committee, I'm sure it's clear now that much of this bill is, and I think uh, the Defender General said the same thing, it doesn't change uh, the rules for lawful search, add to or, or take away from them. Uh, the big difference in this bill uh, is that it provides for removal of firearms that are uh, secured by a lawful search. And so I, I do not know if the Defender General agrees with <coughs> that part of it, but um, certainly that, that is the distinguishing feature in this bill. And so my testimony last week that um, a lot of it is, is not necessary, it was <coughs> said in the context that it doesn't change the existing laws uh, relating to uh, lawful <coughs> searches. So I just wanted to clarify that position. We do not object to the bill. Um, Will will the well maybe you had other points. I, I, a couple of points. I, I have a question, a general question that it might be appropriate right now. Putting on my appropriations hat okay. and understanding that the judiciary is down about a billion dollars from what it requested from the governor. Yes. And I don't know what the house did with that, if anything. And I think they so. bumped it a little, but not a great not, amount. Not a great amount. So. Assuming that we have a million dollar deficit, 988,000 exactly, um, from what was requested by the judiciary. And you handle the increased workload of requiring this within one business day and the length of within one business day. I don't think there will be any financial impact on the court because these cases would be coming in anyway, whether they come in the next day as the bill currently provides or they come in sometime later. Um, obviously, for anyone that, who is arrested and lodged, they're coming in the next day anyway, or by, by video, by video. Um, <laughs> or by video. Or by video, yes. Did you at, 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 least, Did at you least for the time being, I, I <laughs> take every opportunity. Uh -huh. At least until uh -huh. July 1st. <laughs> I, I keep hoping, Senator, but I, 
Uh, anyway, we'll put that aside for another day. But so if well, some, you'll have your, your chance to I know. put the other body on that one. I know. I know. Um, it, so it, it won't increase the workload in that sense because these cases will be coming in anyway. The difference will be is, quite frankly, it's the processing of the paperwork. Then, then that, that burden would initially fall on the police and the state's attorney to make sure they get that paperwork done in time for the court to, to process the cases. So I don't see a financial impact uh, on the court in that sense. Um, and I, I, I would say that in looking at the current version of the bill, um, I did make the suggestion to David Scheer that in line 19 um, that because of the debate going back and forth between consensual or not, or, or including that or not including that and exigent circumstances that you could cover all the areas by simply putting a lawful search and that would not restrict or uh, expand the ability uh, of the officers to secure firearms um, on, on the premises. Um, without uh, getting into, I think uh, David said, getting into the weeds. It allows for any search that is currently uh, lawful. Uh, the, and as I said, that part would be for authorizing the removal of firearms, which is different and which is the essence of this bill. Um, what if you have A, B, and C? Choices here. A would be language that's in front of us. B would be striking during a consensual search. And C would be Judge Pearson. Lawful. A lawful. And, um, I think that, I, I have to admit, I think just saying a lawful search doesn't give a bright line to the police. They don't know what a lawful search is. As opposed to well, I they know what a lawful search is. Lawful search is, but why not spell it out very specifically? Yeah, I, I'm offering then, for then tomorrow, for tomorrow, yeah, three choices, but you can have to. My, my only suggestion, <coughs> response to that, Senator, would be that in setting forth specific ones, you may in fact be eliminating others. So. Um, it, it, it's essentially a policy decision. Um, I have the, the concerns expressed by uh, Mr. Shear and, and uh, Ms. Watersong on imminent harm. I'm not, I, I wasn't sure why the committee was asking for that language. I, I tend to think that it limits, because it then qualifies the removal. So uh, I would I'll be glad to talk with Eric and see if. Uh, I think it can be put someplace else and in a using the word someplace else that would um, do what we wanted to do without making it confusing about the human uh, and when you get down to um, line 10 on page 3 uh, citing the person for the next uh, business day and I'll be glad to try to answer any questions you have Senator Sears about citation um, you may want to consider um, adding a, a phrase that the state's attorney shall seek conditions of release in the event uh, they're going to cite someone. And the reason I say that is when they arrive at the scene of a domestic and they are removed from the home, they, are, they have been arrested. The question then becomes, are they uh, cited in? And if they're cited in, are they going to be cited in for the next day as this calls for? Um, or is there some reason to uh, not bring them in? Uh, but regardless of when they're cited in, I think what's important for purposes of uh, the issues in part driving this bill, the domestic violence, that conditions and release at least be sought without knowing what they would be. Okay. Uh, that would give some protection in that short time period. Uh, if someone is lodged, uh, it's certainly common practice when you set bail as a judge, you will also set condition of release in the event they... So you set a condition of release that they not possess a firearm. Can you also set a condition of release that they turn over firearms to the local law enforcement, or can you do you do can you do that? 
the short answer is yes, we can do it. The, the longer answer is that you're, you're relying, if you will, on no knowledge or self-report from the individual as to what they have for firearms. And so it's, it's in some respects, asking them to surrender what you don't know they have is, is kind of a, but, it, it, but you, can, you can do it. You can say surrender I, firearms. I, 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 this was a drug uh, <laughs> issue, so it wasn't a domestic violence issue. Um, but uh, a male and a female were in court the day I was watching arraignments. And the male and female were brought before the judge for violating conditions of release. And the police came to the apartment, and not only were there additional drugs there, but there were seven firearms, pistols, on the bed. Um, and they had both been ordered not to possess firearms. So um, for whatever reason, the male was incarcerated and the female was released on condi further conditions, but I won't get into why that happened. But what was interesting to me was I didn't hear the judge, maybe I missed it, I didn't hear the judge say, you know, those firearms, maybe, I think the, the, the police did seize those firearms. but. I didn't hear anything about additional firearms, given that the female was released. When you say additional firearms? Well, she might have had others. And I'm going back to your point. And, and I, I think my reaction would be if, if we're aware of firearms being a, a, an issue in the case, that you would order them to not possess fire any additional firearms. Right. But uh, again, well, they had already been ordered not to possess right. any. Right, and that's why I'm saying Clearly even, it didn't issuing, them. even yeah. issuing that order or issuing an order to surrender firearms, um, it, it might look good on paper, but the ability to enforce that is extremely difficult. Um, and, and so that's why I would encourage. But if, but if the victim were to tell the victim's advocate that he had a lot of firearms, he had seven rifles in a lock cabinet in the basement that that would provide the judge with the opportunity to order them to be turned over. Yes, if we have information of specific firearms. The more information we have, the more specific right, we right. can make an order. So you could do that. Right. What, what we can't do, though, is authorize the police to search. to search. And that's why, going back to your question, Senator Benning, to the incident, uh, McCain, is that the name? And you said that would be a place for 221. It's my understanding of those facts. It wouldn't be because that individual, my understanding was, already was facing conditions of release not to have firearms. There was a relief from abuse order that prohibited firearms. Um, and that 221 wouldn't authorize the police to go into any home or other place to look for firearms. So I, I, I did not see that as an application of 221. But I don't, I don't want to get away from this bill. Um, that, that would be my recommendation, I think, having conditions of release, um, whether they are lodged um, or whether they are cited, that the state's attorney uh, should seek those conditions of release. And that would give some security, even yeah. on a short-term basis. Anything else? I do not so think so. Do you have a problem with the definition on, or do you care about 781 on page 3, 781? Where we struck the uh, any other person with a family member meaning, uh, excuse me, line, uh, I, lines I, one, two, and three. Right. I, I felt, and I believe I testified that last week, that I thought the statement of any other person is, is overly broad. Yep. Um, and my concern is it, if you're looking at it from the perspective of the, the domestic violence, the victim, I understand that. Uh, the police are going to have much less knowledge to them, and if you're looking at what guns are they to secure, uh, then they can define, uh, obviously, the, the person that's on the home or the family member. So um, I, if you look at it from the police perspective, they need some guidance, I would think, to know what, what firearm, who are we trying to protect. Um, so it, it, I think it gives them some definition. Any other questions for the judge? Okay. Thank you. Let Thank me you. Clarify. Anybody else who wants to comment right now um, before we have version 4.1 tomorrow? Eric, do you want to give us a couple of minutes? Yeah. Nick Galees.
I'm leaving the quarter at 12 tomorrow. It's a good thing that I had all my plans made. I'm meeting four old, uh, a group of people from UVM that I met. Sorry. I'm probably wrong with that. Interesting to see how old they are. But they look much older than oh, I do, Joe. I, I, I got a picture of my, the female classmates of mine, and I couldn't believe how old they were. I know. It was just stunning. Look at it. Here it is. I'm carrying it with me, sorry. Yeah. You can realize how old they were. Oh, look at all the old ladies. Yeah. <laughs> These bunch of old guys. I know. Walking with limbs and everything else. Oh, gray hair. Gray hair. White hair. Ponchos. No hair. It's still open. Yeah. I had a high school yeah. classmate that was a year younger than I was on Sunday. Oh, yeah. no. No. Right Eric. Yes. Are you familiar with H422? I've heard about that. Is that a girl that came down from the house? Yeah. yeah okay, right. <laughs> it's a straight ball version. Yes. 3.1 yeah. in front of us. Frank. So I think we we're looking at three choices for. Um, Y19. <coughs> yes. So either we'll but I definitely it. think if you keep in consensual search, it needs to be separate from or discovered under extant circumstances. If you keep it the way it is, doesn't it need to be an or there somewhere? Yes, exactly. If, if you're to put it back in reward. consensual search, yeah. it would be an order. You don't need it now because the proposal right. because was going to be struck. struck. But right. if you do put it in, it needs to be an or discovered during a consensual search or under executive search. That's right. So that would be choice B. Um, any thoughts on how to solve the imminent harm problem? I didn't quite follow the problem. If, if the problem, you know, maybe, well, Judge, maybe Auburn could, could, could restate and, it. Um, uh, Auburn believed that it narrows, that we, that was not our intent. Our intent was to provide information to the officer to be able to use. So um, I think it might. The removal is necessary for the protection of the officer. So just think of. Um, that and then if we could grab some language from S221 a separate sentence regarding imminent harm. Yeah. So are you still wanting to include the concept of imminent harm? Because if I'm understanding them right, if you're including the concept, then that means that it's it's somewhat, uh, somewhat a higher level, you might say, than just saying protection of the officer. Because there's some sort of additional, uh, it might be protection that might not be imminent, for example, that could uh, well, justify. I'm that, that, you know, you take it out of that, you take imminent out of that. So uh, if the removal is necessary for protection of the officer, the person being arrested or cited, or a family member of the person being arrested or cited. <clears throat> and then a new sentence. Um, if the officer believes that harm is imminent, he may consult with whomever. Or you could say that the... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, the imminent nature of the harm imminent is a factor harm. to be considered. Yes, yeah, a factor to be considered or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So it yeah. doesn't narrow, right. but it would allow the officer to get that information. Uh -huh. That Because a lot of police departments are moving in the social work arena where they're working with the local mental health centers. Um, How did we say it in 221? That's why I was wondering if we could rob that. Yeah. It doesn't really fit. Oh, uh, that's right. That's where I pulled the imminent fire okay. harm right. phrase okay. from. Okay. Um, so that that we would have a second sentence there. That yep. Would allow the officer to check. Because I do believe that that's becoming more and more the practice of law enforcement. 
is to be involved either with a local <coughs> health center or to have their own. I believe Burlington is actually now has some social workers on staff, and Rutland does as well. Bellows Falls has had social workers really? for a long time mm -hmm. since Keith Clark was the. The, the, more, the more and more they're they, dealing with um, they, yeah. social mm -hmm. as well as criminal. <coughs> I think that would satisfy everyone on this issue. It wasn't designed. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. I think I can work up some ideas there. I guess, you know, I don't know if there's any in between, but I guess the A would be not striking. The A would be family member, uh, any other, and B would be any other person, and that's pretty clear. Those are the, so we're down to a few policy decisions. Right. Um, are there any others? Why don't we? Well, why Judge we... Grierson had some suggestions um, in on line ten through eleven. Am I correct? That the and the state's attorneys are okay with that. Did you catch that one? No, I thought he, I, th I didn't catch it as a, a proposed said change that, to existing he language. He said, "I believe that the state's attorney seeks terms of release." On persons conditions. being cited. Conditions and conditions. Oh, so conditions. it's not all. <coughs> terms of my term. Conditions of release. Was there a concern, Senator Sears, about, uh, I don't want to muck it up, but uh, when you're changing the language from any other person to the person being arrested or cited on lines sort of one through three, page three there. I thought I had heard that there was a concern that that might not include a victim. Was that the concern? Yeah. So but That it might not include the shooter? Is that what you No, mean? the shooter, I think, is included right, in the person right. being arrested or cited. Totally. Right. Right. Um, maybe I misheard that. Because you could just add victim to it, to that list. If, if, there, if there's no concern, then like I said, I don't want to muck it up. But I, I thought I heard that. Well, you could have potential victims. Rather than any other person, potential victim, which could include the mother in law. If you think about the Texas case. Yeah, I think that list could easily read protection from. from Imminent harm of the officer, the victim, the person being arrested or cited, or a family member of the person being arrested or cited, if you wanted as a policy matter. If there was a thought that the existing, that the proposed new language might potentially not be covering the victim. If, if you put in, I don't know what number it would be, but the term imminent harm of any, um, that's where I'd be more comfortable with any potential. The, family member, et cetera, et cetera, or any potential victim. Right, but then there would be a second sentence. That's what you're still thinking, right? Right. And the second yeah. sentence was... So the first sentence, the first, line one would strike the word imminent. Okay. Right, right. And then a new, a new A or whatever, I don't know how to do that, Right. would contain the wording When that something like what with the you know when the officer is determining whether or not the removal is necessary for the protection right. of one of these people, the imminent nature of the harm shall be a factor to be considered. So, something along those lines. Right. Right. Something like that. You're a great wordsmith. <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> it's a minor gift, but it's helpful. <laughs> <laughs> So were you thinking uh, removing just the word imminent yeah. or removing from or removing all well, three of those? I think the original bill had protection from arm of the officer. No, the original bill just said protection of the officer. Okay, so remove from imminent arm. Right. Remove the whole term. Yep. And then do a new one regarding imminent arm. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Yep. Anything else? Did you discard Judge Grierson's suggestion about the McDermott lawful search for 119? That was uh, choice 
three. Right. Eric's going to draft, redraft the bill with everything we would need to, which includes taking out the findings, by the way. Right. The Attorney General took out the findings, if anybody complains at all. I don't recall. Huh? Well, your first draft took out the findings. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. You may not have intended to, but <laughs> okay. no, we, yeah. well, uh, we have a little thing we change. always do with house bills, and that's take out their findings. <laughs> and you you helped us do that without oh, I, I, I really, Yeah, what we gave you was just the... Uh, I understand, but <laughs> so we just adopted your. All right, that's see what happened there. Wasn't quite intentional, but you could, you'd be amazed at what we can get for findings <laughs> and negotiations. Um, so, Joe, what the plan is on lines um, in terms of the searches? Uh, you'd have A, which is what's in front of us right now. B which would bring back in consensual search, and C would be Judge Grayson's proposal. Okay. All right, I think we're done. Okay. I don't think we can do much more until Eric's had a chance to wordsmith and redraft. And what time is it up. scheduled for tomorrow? I was trying to remember that. Is it? Early 8.30 or late 10? I think it's late. late Is it? It's 10.30. 10.30? Great. Is it 10.30, Peggy? Uh, yes, 10.30. 10.30. You've got plenty of time, Eric. You've got yeah. something else to do. Exactly. We know that. Nobody's going to call you from the house, Dave. No, they're all set. They're all set. They don't <laughs> care. Right. No, I didn't say they didn't care. I said they're um, all set. Do you want to... Uh, <laughs> Can you make copies of this for the committee? Yeah. For the Judiciary Committee? Yeah. For tomorrow? Definitely. This is uh, differences between the House version of it, S-221 and the Senate version, as it stands <coughs> this moment. Yeah. There are only three differences, but they are major. Um, so, uh, that way you can see what, what they've done, what they did. All right, great. We done? We done. We done.